Mini episode 489 of the FEH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.info. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Hello, everyone. Welcome to mini-episode number 489 of the FDH Lounge. It's your favorite FDH Lounge dignitary football talkers, Rick Morris and Kyle Ross, breaking down NFL Week 11 for you. It was uh, an interesting one again last week, a real humdinger, as they have been recently. Uh, I was 7-6 and six on all my plays, 2-1 and one on my big three, 0-1 oh on my lock. For the year, I am 74-72-1 and one for all of the games, 16-14 and 14 on the big three, 4-6 and six on the locks. And again, if you jumped off week five when I said this is a high water mark, if you started going Here we go with this week again. Five, <laughs> and with me before then, 90, 70, and 1, 57%. Speaking of 57%, that's where my boy K Dog is for the season, 26 and 20, a 4 and 3 week last week. Uh, I know from talking to you off air, Kyle, you're a little bit uh, frustrated with some of these, but hey, winning territory still for you. Easily, easily winning territory. You know, I actually do feel pretty good about where I'm at, given some of the stuff I've read. This week, I'm actually pretty lucky given my, you know, you know my style, and anyone who listens to the show has come to realize my style. And given that style, I'm pretty lucky to be where, have a winning record because home dogs have not done well this year. They're 16, 22, and 1 against the number. Double digit dogs, I think they're still right above the Mendoza line, depending on, um, you know, where you had some of these games closing at. But it's been tough, and you know, all told, 26 and 20, I'll take it given how I've left feeling on some of these Sundays where I'm scratching my head. This is a tough one where you don't have a lot. Uh, nothing jumped off the page right at me right away. There's not a lot of double-digit dogs. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of home dogs. There's not a lot of obvious situations. This is when you kind of have to hunker down, look at your power ratings, and, you know, you you got to – Decide how you feel about these teams and go with it. So I've got five this week for you. I'm ready to go. It's a challenging uh, week, uh, but uh, aren't they all lately? Uh, by the way, one of my yeah. losses from last week, just showing how honest I am, we joked oh. about this on the show, how frustrated I was. I couldn't find a Dallas-Jacksonville line anywhere. Good friend of the show, Liam O'Rourke, uh, did mention on uh, Facebook, he of the Squared Circle Gazette podcast. Go check it out, uh, guys. It's the best ongoing podcast on pro graphs on the web. He made a note on uh, Facebook. He found a line of, it was right around a touchdown. Uh, I don't remember where yeah. it was exactly, and I said, I'll take Jacksonville, and that was a loss. So I'm being honest and being accountable for it. Wow, uh, you're so really that's... doing that. Oh, yes, I think I that's what we yeah. I think, wow, you're really doing that, huh? Okay. I'm taking a loss that I didn't call on the oh, show. That's how honest I am. Yeah, because we didn't know. You really do have OCD about that. Yeah, I mean, that's what I, I think I we wanna... had to speculate. I think we had to speculate that would be the line on the show. I think one book, like yeah. I found one book that had it. and it, Yeah, it did wind up doing that. Um, I think it moved once they announced Romo. I mean, it obviously didn't matter. I mean, Jackson, the odds makers weren't going to give him nearly enough points to cover that game. But, wow, that's impressive that you were. I was thinking about it. You know, it's probably not so much OCD as it's just that I'm egotistical enough that I want to opine on everything. I, I don't want to opine on everything except uh-huh. the uh-huh. <laughs> you know, I want, uh-huh. I want uh-huh. my opinion out there. <laughs> yeah, so now we that get to sounds the more like it. Yes, that is more like me. By the way, too, and uh, I, I will say going into this week, it's going to be a little bit of a different flavor for me. This being a Veterans Day week, of course, that sets back in these here United States our mail by a day or so, which means it'll take till tomorrow when we're recording, uh, uh, the day after we're recording this, for USA Today Sports Weekly to hit the newsstands. So people will not be treated to my stylings this week about which game the delicious Pam Oliver is on or the lovely Tan Laura Oakman or five-time FDH Lounge guest Kenny Albert or other FDH Lounge guests Ian Eagle and Sam Rosen. At the moment, I don't know where they'll be. 
So well, I'll be leaving aside all the gaga for this week. And for anybody that doesn't like it, hey, it's a holiday for you uh, that you don't have to suffer through that uh, shtick this week. Uh, as I am blissfully ignorant of what's going on there, we have on the bye week this week, Baltimore, Dallas, and uh, the Jets, and Jacksonville. Two of those teams may make a playoff run. Two of those teams may be battling for the top pick in the draft next year. And, Kyle, we'll just let everybody figure out who's who. I think it should be pretty obvious at this point. (laughs) (laughs) Although the Jets finally came through. The Jets finally came through last week. Let's talk about We both had them. That was a game where the – that was like the one game that reaffirmed my faith in betting because the public finally got a well-deserved bat. On that, like that was the game that John Q was pounding his chest. Oh, you know, how, how can the Steelers only be favored by four or five points over the Jets? Oh, I loved every second of that game. It was one of my favorite games to watch all year. Well, I enjoyed it as well, having uh, the Jets as a play, and also being a uh, a hater of the Squealers. And I will say this: I oh, happened boy. to be last Sunday watching the game down in the Akron Canton area, which uh, again, for folks outside of the Greater Cleveland area. Strangely enough, might as well be a suburb of Pittsburgh for the very pronounced fifth column down there of uh, Steeler fans. So suffice to say, it was all the more uh, fun watching it in those environs. No question about it. And it was a winner for both you and I on our recommended plays. Uh, Starting with the Thursday game this week here, as we always do, Miami Dolphins are hosting the Buffalo Bills. Uh, the Dolphins are laying six in this one, up from an initial four. This is one that just kind of keeps uh, rising and rising as far as yeah. the line goes here. And I, I, I am certain I know who's going to win. To me, it's more of a coin flip on uh, who I think is going to cover. I'll go with the team I think is going to win. My reasoning on this one, is I look at this, I look at the success that the Bills have had on the road this year, where they, they won at Chicago. And, and by the way, this is always fascinating in terms of revisionism here. You look at that game, no, oh, press visit, look at the Bears. The Bears were a pretty damn good team coming out of training camp. They were who we thought they were. They've been transformed into the mess that we see now. And that Bills game was one of the first things that transformed them. So let's not diminish what that took. That was an impressive win. They beat Detroit on the road. If they beat Miami, we're obliged to look at this Buffalo team and say they're even better than their record. You know what? They're not. They're not better than their record. They're more. They're plus or minus a 500 team, even with Doug Marone doing everything but selling the fracking rights under Buffalo for the next 100 years just to get another player or two on this roster before he gets canned next year. Even with every all the stops that Buffalo's pulling out, they are who we think they are. They're, they're a pretty good team relatively speaking, in the AFC. But they're not better than their record. If they win this game, we're obliged to say they're even better than their record. I can't say that. I'll take Miami to win, and uh, I'll take them to cover, although for me it's more of a coin flip on covering. I like where your head's at with the analysis of that game. That's the way I look at this one, too. You. Uh, you know, the records say these teams are even, and I think you know the public at large views them as even. You're two, five, and four teams kind of stuck in the middle in the AFC playoff race. But I will say this. The odds makers obviously don't think they're even because Miami's laying more than three. Right. And if you look at the point differentials, they're not even. Miami's plus 56 for the year. Buffalo's only plus nine. So Buffalo, who, by the way, I did before the year, they would be a playoff team. And but at eight and eight, I don't think eight and eight's going to get in uh, to the playoffs in either conference not even the AFC, which is a little deeper than expected. Right. And they may finish with a better record, but at the end of the day, you know, Kyle Orton, he's who we thought he was as well. You talk about is who we thought they were. Yep. Kyle Orton in that category, he's starting to show some signs. I would, I'm hesitant to lay the points because the number's increasing. What I would do here, do a teaser on side and total, tease Miami, uh, not, you know, you could tease them if you want to do a six-point teaser, you could tease them a pick where they have to win straight up, or you could, you know, do a seven-point teaser. It's probably worthless way the extra juice because what's, I mean, they're, I mean, what's the game going to be a tie? Probably not. So if you do a six-point teaser, Miami and the under, tease that number up uh, because these are these are two defensive-minded teams. The one issue for Miami is that they've lost Brandon Albert. Buffalo's defensive line is very good. 
So I think the Bills are going to be able to stay in this game. It will not be another Thursday night blowout, probably low scoring. But I'm with you in the end. Miami's going to win. Miami's the better team here. They are. I, and, and, again, the funny thing is I keep saying they're my 1A team as far as being my second favorite team personally. And I've been really down on them on the show this year. So I mean, I'm, I'm having to eat my words about a team that I actually they, like, which is kind of you know, an interesting they, spot to be in. They, they had probably peaked, though, in value going into that game last week against Detroit. You know, both you and I right. had Detroit. And they were lucky to be to have a chance to win the game. If it had not been for the, return, the block field goal and the long return, their offense didn't do anything in that game against a, a, a tremendous Lions defense, admittedly, but they're going up against another tremendous defense here. So that, that's another reason to be wary of uh, laying points with Miami in this spot. We thought they'd kind of be exposed against that Detroit defense, and we were right about that. Uh, when I speak of Miami as being my 1A team, of course, my, my favorite team is my hometown Cleveland Browns. That's where we start our Sunday games. My Browns are laying three at home against Houston, as I say. Uh, sounds my USA Today Sports Weekly. I don't know who's the announcers on this, but I'm going to go out on a limb that it's not the A team for CBS <laughs> of Nance, Sims, and Wolfson. Just calling my no, shot on that, Kyle. I don't think it will be either. I don't think it will be either. <laughs> uh, an interesting game because uh, the Browns, and, and the funny thing is, in some ways, they remind me of the 4 Browns, although they're obviously a better team than that. But that was a team I remember saying that year. They're like the foil in a movie. They're they're like the they're 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 the element that plays off the main character, and that's kind of who they are this year too. If they're playing a good team, they may look like a good team. If they're playing a garbage team, they may play down to their level. But basically, they're just a foil in somebody else's story. So how does that shape up against Houston here? They're going to be going to a new quarterback with Ryan Mallett. Historically, uh, over the last couple of years, and again, it's a new regime with Mike Pettin, I understand that. This is the kind of spot, again, where the Browns typically play down to that, make the new guy look like a future Hall of Famer because they don't have any tape on him. This is a really, really tough one uh, for me here. <sighs> Because, you know, I'm obviously hoping the Browns will prove me wrong as they have in some picks up earlier this year when I've gone against them. But I'm going to take Houston with the three mm. points on the road. We're hearing that Arian Foster is supposed to be back in there. The Browns' run defense uh, has really, really been one of the bigger underachieving units in the league this year, notwithstanding them being 6-3. and three. If Foster can kind of just keep moving the chains, moving the chains, keep the uh, Browns' offense out of rhythm, could be a long day for the Brownies. I'm going to say Texans on the road. Partially, too, because I'm stubborn, and I'm not quite ready to give up on Houston as a playoff team. Yeah, you are a stubborn old prick, aren't you? Um, I am. <laughs> you, 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 co you covered Houston, or pardon me, Cleveland, so eloquently there. I'm going to point out something, Well, Yeah. Every year, there's a team that goes from worst to first, right? Mm -hmm. What we yep. was talking about before the year, and there were those, you know, polls on ESPN, which team do you think it'll be? Right now, the choice is down to this, Cleveland or nobody. I'm telling you, we have been saying all year when we couldn't figure it out, there's going to be some stinky, smelly team that rises up and grabs an AFC playoff spot. After watching what I saw last Thursday, by the way, I had the Browns plus the points, didn't need them, thank you very much. I think mm -hmm. it might be this team. This AFC North is wide open right now. It's just wide yeah. open and it's for the taking. And with Houston, this is what I want to talk about. I've mentioned on the show before, and let's mention it again. As a favorite this year, Houston, 4-0 and straight up and against the spread. As an underdog, 0-6 straight up and against the spread. The Browns, I get the history of tripping up in games like this. They lost. They're the only team to lose Jacksonville this year. But I actually think the Browns' trip-up game is going to come next week in Atlanta. Not recommending it, and it, they're not going to win in a blowout, but I think the Browns are going to win this game and go to 7-3. and three. I hope you're right and I'm wrong. It's interesting, too. I was thinking when you were saying that about Houston, because we've talked about that with them on the show previously, Houston in their own kind of way is almost kind of like a foil. I know we've said previously on the show – uh, but but that's it, 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 almost in the reverse kind of way. When they run into good teams, yeah. they lose. When they run into bad teams, they win. And the fact that the Browns are still a team that we're struggling to get our hands around is what makes this game so interesting. 
Yeah, it, it really is. I mean, Houston, look, they, they are going to get to 8-8. Eight eight. Excuse me, as my dog is very rude here. Um, <laughs> but uh, Houston's going to probably get to 8-8 eight eight by beating the teams they should and losing the teams you think they would. I, I, they So far, it's been an easy-to-read trend. And, you know, I mean, as much as people are going to be calling let down off a big Thursday night win, I am not sold on Ryan Mallett. I mean, I don't think Brian Hoyer deserves a, a, this huge contract some here in Cleveland that he does, but I'm not sold on Ryan Mallett at all. I've never. I understand. I've never been a huge. I, I have never been driving, you know, the Ryan Mallett for starter campaign truck to, ever. I mean, I, well, I don't ever think I will. So. And not only that, it's a situation also where I'd be more worried about the Brownies having a letdown if it was on the road at home. First place, oh, my God, I can't even imagine what the stadium is going to be like on Sunday. That is going to be yeah. pretty yeah, electric. much better at home, to too. To. Yeah, so uh, prove me wrong, Browns. Uh, also, in the uh, Rust Belt area, our next game here, it's the Chicago Bears coming off uh, one of the most shameful performances in NFL history on Sunday night. They are weighing uh, three points at home, down from four and a half against Minnesota, a team that uh, has a better record than them right now at four and five which just shows you how much the Bears have underachieved. They're one of the biggest underachievers in the league thus far. And, again, part of that has been, and, and, and while they got sandblasted on the road Sunday night, one of the big things with them has been that home record. And I just keep coming back to that. They are due to turn it around at some point. You look at yeah. uh, the other most shameful game of the year, Tampa Bay, earlier on against Atlanta, and they won the next game against Pittsburgh. It doesn't have any effect necessarily on the next week. I, I don't think it has a positive motivational effect, to be sure, but it doesn't have a negative effect either, uh, necessarily. I'll take the Bears laying the three in this game. Yeah, you talk about the Bears' ATS woes at home under Mark Treston. They've covered just once in two years. That's not wow. Good. But you talk about it's due to turn around. How about the next two weeks? They host Minnesota and Tampa Bay. Yep. First recommendation of the week. Bears, what are they going to give up 50 points every week? <laughs> I, I just think coming off of that, and remember, they got housed the week before the bye in New England. Yep. They've given up over 100 points the last two games. I think it's the most, uh, I think I saw a stat on Sunday Night Football, it was the most points allowed in consecutive weeks since like 1923. Ooh. If this team has any pride, they show up and win this home game. I can't ima- Another thing, I can't imagine Minnesota being 5-5. Five and five. Really, yeah. And, yeah, and I that's like how true. the numbers. That's true. I, I, I like how the numbers coming down too. I mean, that can always be dangerous. Oh, you know, I can't see this team having this record. But I do like how the lines coming down as well. The original line that was posted, you know, at the Las Vegas Hilton, the Superbook, uh, before the Bears, you know, embarrassed themselves on Sunday night, was actually minus five and a half. So you're getting a, a, a lot of value here. It might almost be worth waiting to see if it goes under three. I don't know if it will. I mean, three is yeah. a key number, but it, it, at three, just playing a field goal at home, Chicago's got to turn this thing around. I don't know if Mark Tresson is going to be coaching this team next year, uh, but if uh, I do know if the Bears get housed again this week, he may not be coaching them next week. Well, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. And, uh, again, I, I also can't picture the Vikings at 5-5, five and five, which adds to the vehemence of my thoughts here. This might have been a recommended play, except for how badly the Bears screwed me on it being a recommended play last week. I'm burned yeah. just enough not to trust them. By the way, you mentioned about uh, since 1923, and we all remember how rollicking the run and shoot offenses were in that year, right, Kyle? So that, that really says something uh, as far as. Yes, uh, I know, really. Like, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, sure. The yeah, other teams weren't even passing. Jesus, how bad do you have to be to get up that many points in 1923? But yeah, you said about being afraid to recommend bad teams. Uh, I. I do not share in that. I will recommend the Chicago Bears this week. Yeah, nothing says the era of spread offenses like a bunch of guys in leather helmets. That's a real anomaly yeah. right there, no question about it. The uh, the Bears, of course, having been thoroughly embarrassed by the Green Bay Packers, who we have up next here. Pack is laying six at home against Philadelphia, uh, up from four and a half at the outset. Uh, to me, one of the toughest games to pick of the yeah. week. Uh, Mark Sanchez looked pretty good on uh, Monday night against uh, Carolina, as, as I figured he would. I, I, that's probably more to do with Carolina just being a, a crap fraud team, as we've been saying for a while. 
in this game, ultimately, I like Philadelphia. You, you you laugh when I keep going back to this with Green Bay, but the whole thing about them, that rush defense, at least statistically, not good. I think that Philly's going to be able to keep moving the chains. Well, Sean McCoy, after an atrocious start to the season, has got them going a little bit better. The rhythm is there. Some prolonged drives against Aaron Rodgers, that's what you want. I'm not saying Philly's going to win outright, but they can, and I think they'll cover the six. This is a tough game to call. Like Miami, and like a game that we haven't talked about yet, Cincinnati at New Orleans, it's a game where I definitely like the favorite to win straight up at home, but I'm weary of laying the points. Green Bay, you know, everybody loves Green Bay now. By the way, I I told you this team's going to go on a huge run last week. I said that, and then I still believe it. Philadelphia, I still got to believe there's some regression in there, so that's why I think the Packers win. Both teams are actually coming – you actually throw out last week's results for both in that, you know, a team that's off a huge win at home and tends to be overvalued the following week. I guess maybe that applies to Green Bay here a little bit because the number's been bet up. So, yeah, I can see the Eagles staying within the number, but Green Bay is going to win this game. Green Bay is not losing many games down the stretch, I'm telling you right now. It's, it's actually, I believe, the last week of the year – as I continue to do research during the week looking for some semblance of clarity in this league. I think that last game of the year when they host Detroit might be for home field advantage in the NFC. That would be fascinating. And uh, you, you've picked Green Bay on the show as the number one seed in the NFC playoffs, so that would make sense, of course. Yeah, you know what, though? No, no. Well, we'll talk about Detroit later on. We'll talk about Detroit okay. later on. We got yeah, them coming uh, up. I, I, I already, yes, I already might be I changing that pick. Oh, oh, interesting. Okay. Uh, up next, it is uh, Atlanta at Carolina in, in a battle of uh, teams in by far, by far the worst division in football. The Panthers are laying one and a half down from two and a half at the outset. I look at this, and again, this is another tough one, but it has to just be, as far as this line goes, that whole kind of outdoor bias with the Falcons. OMG, they're playing an outdoor game because I look at this and they're both frauds. All right, Atlanta can't win a game outside of this atrocious division. They've proven yeah. that. And Carolina. Yeah, so, it's not really, so it's not really something to be made fun of, the fact that they can't win out. Although they did win outdoors last week against a really bad Tampa Bay team. Well, yeah, yeah, there, there is that. Other than that, um, other than that, this team that never would does. I mean, you know, it is right to factor in the fact that they never went outdoors. So it's not. I don't think we should sugarcoat that at all. Well, except that Carolina also is a garbage team, so there, there is that. That's very and, true. Uh, well. I think they're the bigger fraud in my mind at the moment. Cam Newton is out there basically uh, limping around on uh, half a rib cage. Uh, again, I'm going to take Atlanta with the one and a half in this one. Uh, they're, they're the better team at this point albeit marginally, albeit they're both frauds, but uh, give me the better team getting one and a half on the road. I see where you're coming from. Look, I thought Atlanta would be improved this year. Carolina is where I thought, you know, I thought they were my number one regressor coming into the season. I, I only picked five wins. They started 2-0, and oh and I looked real dumb. They might wind up with five wins, quite frankly. Uh, Atlanta... So many holes on that roster. They are three and zero in the division, though zero and six out of the division. Just shows you how heinous the NFC South truly has become. The Falcons have the better point differential, minus nineteen, compared to Carolina, minus eighty three. But I'm not picking the Falcons outdoors. I didn't do it last week. I'm not going to do it here. But here's what gives me pause about Carolina, along with Pittsburgh. They're the only team that has not had a bye left. They're, we've seen some of these teams with late buys really limp into the off week. That could be what's going on with Carolina. I cannot endorse either of these teams in good conscience, Rick Morris. I don't blame you. They both suck. Uh, as a matter of fact, the team uh, that is basically the uh, most appetizing shade of brown out of that whole division, if you want to put it that way, is the New Orleans Saints. Uh, they are laying seven points at home against Cincinnati, up from five and a half initially. And uh, I, I look at a couple of different things here again. New Orleans was due to lose at home. They had that uh, that uh, incredibly long home winning streak. Yeah. San Francisco called it last week. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, 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 both both had, we both had it. Yeah. We both had it. We both had it last yeah. week with the Niners. San Francisco was the team to be able to puncture it. Cincinnati, as we saw uh, last Thursday night, is not such a team. 
You mentioned this before on the show, and when I was looking at this year's log, it jumped out at me again. New Orleans, for, for being a bad team, uh, at least not a bad team. Locations, has had one bad game this year. That's yes. it. They're, they're, they are basically better than their record, and their record is atrocious you know, relative to their talent level. Give me New Orleans lay in the seven because I think they're going to romp on a soft Bengals team that is spiraling. Here's the thing. I, I think everyone's thinking that, though, and it, that scares me. Uh-huh. If, with that number, it's going to be close. I, I don't think New Orleans is going to blow them out as badly as maybe you do. I'll say this, though. If you love point differential as a predictor for future success, and I kind of do, there's a case to be made to agree with you, Rick Morris. New Orleans has actually outscored its opponents by 26 points this year, despite being 4-5. and five. Because they started out in such a hole, they're not going to run away with this division, but they are by far and away the class of this division, and they're going to get a home game in the playoffs, and they're going to be a very dangerous team come that time of year. Mark my words. Mark my words. Four yeah. of their five losses have been by a field goal or less. They've just been a really unlucky team, quite frankly. They've been in position to win every game. If they, if they don't you know, leave Michael Crabtree inexplicably open at the end of the game, they would have won last week. We'd be having a much different conversation. You want to talk about fraudulent teams. You've named a couple so far. The Cincinnati Bengals are the king of that group from where I sat. Last yep. week, the Andy Dalton era, I believe – while it may not have officially come to an end, for all intents and purposes, it's over. This team, despite being 5-3-1, and one, has actually been outscored by 14 points this year. They are not a playoff team. They are going to finish in last place in the AFC North. But despite all that, I'm afraid to lay the point. Well, I believe you a lot more when you say the era of Andy Dalton is over than I did believe Bubba when he said the era of big government was over. No question about that. You have more credibility on that subject. The, uh... Oh, boy. <laughs> Oh, boy. <laughs> Up next, I know I know you love when I find uh, angles on uh, games here, historical ones. We have a battle of the last two teams to be NFL champions in the twenties, uh, the, the uh, 20th century. It's the 1998 season champion Denver Broncos at the 1999 season champion St. Louis Rams. And the Broncos are laying nine and a half on the road here, uh, again, up from eight initially. And uh, this is this is a very very tough game as well because again you, you talked about it before uh, with, with, with Green Bay you're sure they're going to beat Philadelphia but it's a tougher call in terms of the line you said the same thing with with Miami same thing here does anybody doubt that Denver is is going to win this game and it's a, it's a necessary game now that they're kind of up against the eight ball in the AFC with New England holding the tiebreaker on them for home field but what I keep coming back to. An odd, odd quirk of the schedule makers this year. A number of teams are getting 37.5% of all of their road games together. That means three-eighths, kids, for those of you who skipped a math class. Yeah, the that Broncos, has been very bizarre. Yes, yes. They, they are completing that 37.5% run here, third consecutive road game, uh, and they've had to go kind of all over the country to do it. So even though Denver – to St. Louis is kind of like a puddle jumper trip on a on a, a jet, you know. What's it? Maybe a half hour, hour or whatever. It's still another road trip. They may be sluggish. Give me St. Louis to just limp inside of the nine and a half. Yeah, you talk about St. Louis just played its third straight road game last week. Uh, really let it right. get away from them late against Arizona. Yeah, exactly. I, we will talk about that game when we talk about Arizona because I, how you go from winning and having the other team's starting quarterback tear his ACL to giving up 21 unanswered points, I don't know. I'd, I'd like to say that betting isn't supposed to be as easy as taking Denver here, but my God, they went at Oakland last week and crushed the Raiders, laying even a bigger number. If I were going to play this game, it would be the under. Denver has now gone over in six consecutive games, so the market's due to correct itself a little bit there, and this is easily the Rams' highest total of the year. It's a full touchdown higher than what we're used to seeing from them. So uh, Denver won't probably score as many as they did last week against the Raiders. So I don't know. I, I'd go under here. Well, no, I'm, uh, not just touching, quick question. I'm, not, I'm not touching the side. I'm not touching the side. Quick question, though, uh, on powers of deduction here. Uh, if you're right about the total, that probably favors the Rams with their feeble offense, right? 
Uh, yes, generally unders and uh, the underdog go hand in hand, while favorites and the okay. over go hand in hand. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I do. But look, I mean, here's the thing: the, the game can stay under 50 points with Denver doing almost all the scoring. You know, I mean, that's we, true. If, if we're doing this show next week and Denver won 34-7, are either of us surprised? And that's Probably again, not. you know, Peyton Manning for so long a dome quarterback. This is a team much like Green Bay that is, if anything, probably at more, at home more in a dome, which is where they happen to be this week. So it's just kind of an odd quirk about a cold weather team that's actually better on the finesse turf. Well, at one time, the fastest show on turf in St. Louis. So that's I think I'm like I, I know Pete. I know you, and you know maybe maybe your dad too, given his uh, persuasion in the college game. Don't want to hear it, but I think all teams are better in domes these days. I don't, uh, I don't think any team. I don't think any team is like, yeah, you know what we want to do? We want to play in right. a wizard this week. The only team that, I want to that, do is the crappy teams because it introduces more variance. That may very well be. Uh, seven games here left. Uh, next up here, Uh-oh. the 49ers <laughs> looking to avenge the NFC Championship game loss of a few years ago to the New York Giants. They are laying four at the Meadowlands, up from three initially. It had been four and a half at one point in time here. The only thing that keeps me from making this a recommended pick on San Francisco is just how up and down the Giants could be. And if they actually showed a pulse, would it uh, surprise you? But, uh, again, San Francisco, it it makes me leery about the Giants sneaking underneath uh, to lose by a field goal, but I'm going to take them. At this point, they're the much better team. They showed it last week against New Orleans. I'm stubborn. I'm not getting off that bus. They're making the playoffs, and if they're doing that, they can't afford to dump this one. Niners, minus four. Ultimately, the Niners, it will come down to them or Arizona for the final spot. I can't trust either of these teams with the spread. I can't trust the Niners laying points on the road after a huge road win last week. I just can't trust the Giants, period. I, I don't know what to make of them. They, they've been really bad the last couple games. So, pass all the way. Okay. Up next, it is uh, San Diego laying 10.5 at home against Oakland. Uh, it had been 8 initially and then uh, 10 and now 10.5. Uh, San Diego, again, when you look at time of possession between the teams here, that strikes me as being something that could be very, very decisive here, a chance to get that running game untracked. San Diego has to be the team in the league that needed the bye week probably the most out of any team yes. this year, any of the good teams anyways. They needed it. That, that losing streak going in was crippling. People are going to be expecting a tighter one because of the first game, but I said at the time I think that was Oakland's high watermark. And I think that they are just going to get uh, absolutely demolished here. San Diego, minus 10.5 at home. Normally, I would look to a division dog of more than a touchdown. I will not look to this particular division dog. 0-16 is a very harsh reality and a very possible uh, reality for the Oakland Raiders at this point. Favorites off a bye were 3-0 and against the number last week. I would never endorse laying double digits, but... It's tough to make a case for Oakland here. And I'll say this, the next two weeks must win for the Chargers at home against Oakland and St. Louis. If they do not win both games, they have zero chance of making the playoffs. That is definitely true. Uh, A battle that uh, could have a lot to say about home field advantage in the NFC coming into the year. Who would have believed it? It's uh, the miracle Arizona Cardinals laying two at home down from three initially against Detroit. This is a game where, again, arguably the better team at the moment uh, anyways, particularly with Carson Palmer being out, would be Detroit, and they're getting points. That, to me, is always an interesting scenario. I'm not as down on Arizona as you are, Kyle. I don't think anybody is as down on Arizona as you are. But I agree with you that the worm has got to start turning at some point. I'm a big regression and progression to the mean guy, and it starts this week for the cards. I say take the Lions and the points. Well, uh Personal fact here, let's, let's, let's go behind the scenes, pull back the curtain, Rick Morris. Uh, my fiance's right. birthday is on January 31st. All right. Why do I bring this up? Because if I have to look her in the eye on January 31st and say, honey, you did not get a present this year because the Arizona Cardinals bankrupted me, I am willing to do that. The Detroit Lions are a recommendation. I don't know how Arizona is where they are. They are a, We don't have enough time. I could take up the rest of the show ranting. They are, if Tim Tebow was a team, he would be the Arizona Cardinals. I am sick of this turning it on in the last 10 minutes crap. That doesn't doesn't mean you want it more. It's all flukiness. 
They have Drew Stanton at quarterback now. There is no way in hell they're going to win this game. No way in hell they're winning this game. And I think, by the way, they're going to they're going to choke just like Kansas City did on the stretch. I think I look for this team to lose five of its final seven games. I am really starting to think without Carson Palmer, they may not make the playoffs. And I say that having installed them for the moment as number one in the FDH power rankings. But again, that's at the moment. We'll see what happens in the Drew Stanton era. By the way, fortunately for you, in the scenario you were talking about there, your fiance uh, is a woman of famously humble taste there. I'm sure you can scrounge up something on a budget and make it look good. She's very tolerant in that regard. So you're playing with a net, Kyle. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me about that, by the way. <laughs> oh, God. Now Excuse me, Wally. Go. Really cheap one to blame. <laughs> That's awesome. Excuse me, Wally. Yeah, let's go to the next game. Let's go to the next game while I look at the couch cushion. All right. <laughs> we got four left, but uh, one of them, uh, of course, the Sunday nighter. That's one of my big three plays. We'll skip over that. We'll go right to the Monday nighter. Uh, Pittsburgh at Tennessee. Steelers are laying six up from four uh, initially. And, again, a, a difficult situation uh, here uh, for uh, Tennessee. I mean, their season is basically done at this point. It's the quarterback situation. You and I talked about this last week. We expected a letdown against the Jets, but I think they got it out of their system. I, I cannot endorse even saying that Tennessee is going to keep this one close, uh, given the absolutely horrid nature of what they got behind center right there. So I'll take Pittsburgh minus six on Monday night and get well game. You know what? I don't like this play. I, I told you before the show I was going to recommend it. I really uh, don't like it. Okay. But the line's going to go up. Wait till Monday to bet this game, folks, and take the home dog. Okay. Pittsburgh hasn't had its bye yet. And everyone Ooh. and their mother is going to expect them to bounce back. I think they're going to win close. If Tennessee, I mean, when was the last time they were even competitive in a game? This is a very bad football team, of course. I, I try, I, you, if you remember, I recommended them last week against Baltimore, and they stayed competitive for three quarters. But I was just like, God, can this game, like, end or something? Can there be, like, a lightning <laughs> strike? Because it was so obvious that their offense wasn't going to do anything. Yep. This is a bad, bad team. But one of these bad teams has to come in through the back door on Monday night once this year, don't they? Tennessee gets a recommendation. Third of the week. Third of the week. All right. Third recommendation. And uh, I know you're not done with the recommendations either. We'll get into uh, my big three and see where they coincide. Up next, wow. it's uh, the New England uh, Patriots on the road Sunday nighter at Indianapolis. Uh, the Colts are laying three up from two initially. And, uh, again, a, a, a tough game here. Indianapolis, if they win this game, uh, you know, they're, they're right in the uh, conversation uh, themselves for at least a bye in uh, the AFC, if not home field going throughout. But I look at it, and as far as who's proven more at this point in the season, to me, New England has looked more impressive than Indianapolis. And, and that even counts their, their low stretch that they had earlier on where, where people were counting them out. Now, this could be a signature win for Indianapolis. I, I, might, I might be saying this right before they get that one win, but they don't have that one win that really impresses me. New England has a bunch of them this year. I see them rising up. I'll take the points with them on Sunday night. Rick Morris, can we do this? We're going to do something here. You said uh, the line's three now? You said the line's yeah. three? Yeah. We're making an on-air change. Folks, okay. I hope you're still listening. We're not recommending right. Tennessee anymore. We're, th- th- this is a killer. I am screwing myself. I'm going to go two and three this week now, not three and two. I know it. I freaking <laughs> okay. know it. We're scratching Tennessee. They're not recommended. We're going to recommend New England. Okay. Which, which means I that I may agree with all of your big three. We're going to recommend New England because on a neutral field, you know, you know this is basically saying that these teams are even and Indy's getting three from. I have New England slightly better. Um, and also, I go back to the Colts won all those close games the last two years. That record yep. going to even out. They're not going to win this game in a blowout. Right. So, get, you know what? This is my new third recommendation. Screw you, Tennessee. I watched you last week. I can't recommend you in good conscience anymore. <laughs> new England, getting points, always profitable with Bill Belichick. New England's my third recommendation. 
you, you have recommendations on all three of my games here, uh, then, as it turns out. And by the way, folks, when we coincided the last two weeks, when we wind up on this four and two, so that should make uh, the big three, if indeed we coincide on the sides here, which I think we're going to, going to make it even stronger. Up next, it is yeah, Washington. They're winning I think seven. We're 2-0 uh, last what? week. Yeah, 2-0 two, two oh last week. That's right, 2-0 oh last week. Uh, I don't remember what it was. I think one and one the week before. So, all right. So three and one. Yeah. So even better than that. You're right about that. I I was four and two on my big three the last two weeks. But yeah, I think it was I four and two the last like, three weeks. Yeah, I think it was four and two the last three weeks. We um we we lost that same game. Okay. We went to other ones. Yeah. Rattling around in my head. Okay. So so you and I have had a pretty good record when we agree here on our strongest <laughs> ones. The Redskins are laying seven at home against Tampa Bay, and this is this has happened with me earlier in the year. I think it was when Washington was playing Jacksonville. I made him a why ask why pick. I don't know if the Redskins, notwithstanding their record, maybe being a little better than some people might have thought this year and certainly being better than how they've looked overall. I'm not sure they're better than just about anybody in the league by seven points. I don't get it. I understand the amount of contempt that's out there for Tampa Bay, but again, Tampa is just about the best you know, one win team in the history of the NFL at this point. They are not that bad of a team on paper, comparable, if not better, in a lot of areas in Washington. I don't get Ooh, it. I don't Tampa Bay could win this game. Yeah, I don't know. You, you, you start getting into the skill positions and everything. I mean, I'm not, you know, super enamored of Washington's uh, talent the way that some people are. Certainly not enamored of them at quarterback, regardless of who's playing. Again, if I don't get it, I go the other way. Why is Washington laying seven beats the hell out of me? Tends to take the Redskins. I'm contradicting myself on that last pick because Indianapolis is off a of bye, but New England is too, so there's the caveat. Favorites off a of bye last week, 3-0 and against the spread. Washington's got the extra week for fair. Look, at Tampa Bay, I'm done saying they're better, they're better than their record. This team stinks. I mean, they stink bad. Redskins with a big win coming off the bye. Yes, I agree with you again, Rick Morris. Yeah, but I mean, Tampa Bay is like underachiever bad. They're not bad talent bad. They're, they're, they're like a worse version of Chicago, if that's even possible at this point. Well, they, yeah, don't, I mean, they, they don't, but I mean, you know, they've got some talented players, but right. I mean, they just stink. Eventually, eventually, if you keep underachieving, you just stink. And Tampa Bay stinks. Well, yeah. Well, well I can't. I can't. They're really bad. But they are really I, bad. I can't argue with that point. They, they they have looked very bad throughout the course of the season. Up last year, it's the thousand star gold plated lock of the millennium for NFL Week Eleven. I am four and six on my locks of the millennium thus far this season. We go with the Seattle Seahawks at Kansas City and uh, a former AFC West battle. Uh, the Seahawks are getting two points in this one. Uh, Kansas City had been getting one initially, so we've seen a uh, change in the spread here. This is one where, again, we talk about this, uh, the better team getting points, even if it's only two. The Seahawks are the better team. They're getting points. This is one that they need. Kansas City is not as good as their record, just like they weren't last year. You got to believe that uh, they're. If you don't think they're as good as or better than their record, they have no business laying points, and they're not. Take Seattle. I'm coming around a little bit on Kansas City, even though they clearly did not deserve to win that game last week against Buffalo. Buffalo really gave it to them. Buffalo, I thought outplayed them. Uh, uh, Ricky, wow, this is a first on the show. I, I, I am recommending all three of your. Of your three big three. Uh, I love wow. Seattle this week. I absolutely love them. Typically when a home team is off a big win, or per, I'm sorry, pardon me, let me start again. Let me get the toilet paper out of my mouth. When a team is off a big win at home the previous week, like Seattle is, they typically are overvalued the following week. Uh, a funny thing has happened here, and Seattle is not overvalued. This is the first time all year that they're an underdog. you got to take advantage. Kansas City kind of reminds me of Miami a little bit last week where they may be at the apex of uh, their popularity. They do have the best spread record in the league, 7-1-1 one, and one so far, but that's due to come down. Kansas City, a playoff threat. I just think in terms of value, you cannot pass up the Seahawks, who I think are going to play very well down the stretch. Thank you very much. Seattle, fifth recommendation this week. Wow. All right, so, so my big three, you're winding up behind all of them. My lock play of uh, Seattle – 
my other yep. plays of Washington and uh, New England. Again, I, I'm taking two dogs there, which is kind of uh, you know strange. I like but, it. Uh, road road, I like road it. dogs in my case here. Road dog, Ricky. Yes, yeah. but a call, yo, bookie. The other plays, of course, that you are making are on Detroit and on, as I scan here, Chicago, Chicago. as well. So. That's what we have. We're heading into NFL Week 11. We will watch with rapt attention to see how well our plays go here. And, uh, again, looking forward to catching up with you next week, my man. Can't wait. Thank you, and thank you for tuning in, everybody, to mini-episode number 489 of the FDH Lounge. As we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, all clear channel affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IAmBoard.com, Billboard.com, Google.com, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, NBA TV, NFL Network, Sports Time Ohio, Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QVC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Papermate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse and the Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements. 